Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School Lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of Lesson number 7 of the Sabbath School Lessons on the Book of Mark. This lesson is titled Teaching Disciples Part 1 and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, August 17. The author is Dr. Robert R. Shepherd of Andrews University, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 10. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the book of Mark so far we've learnt who Jesus is. And this week, as we work into the stories that tell us about how the disciples came to understand who he is, that we may catch a fresh glimpse of who he actually is and that we may be able to not only love him but share that love with others around us, that we may not just know about him but that we may let others know about him as well. So, Lord, bless us as we open your word. And today I'd like to pray for Hazel Jeffrey, for Dor- Donis Jakasa in Zambia, from Kellegswang Hallard in Calgary, in Alberta, in Canada, for Claire Lewis and her family, for Zipporah Noyanga in Kenya, who I believe works in the health area. Lord, bless each of them in their daily lives and in their walk with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from Mark chapter 8, verse 34. When he had called the people to himself, with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Hey Sam, will you read that for us again? I'm Sam from Casino, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 8, verse 34. When he had called the people to himself, and his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Mark chapter 8 verse 34 The first half of Mark focuses on who Jesus is. His powerful teaching and miracles point in the same direction. He is the Messiah. At this crucial turning point in the narrative, Jesus will ask the disciples who they believe him to be. Peter will give a clarion answer to that question and Jesus will immediately begin to explain where his steps as Messiah are headed, which we know is the cross. In the last part of Mark chapter 8 through the end of Mark 10, Jesus focuses on teaching his disciples about his journey. In these chapters, he will give predictions about the cross. These will be followed by special instruction on discipleship. These powerful lessons remain relevant today. This section of the second gospel is marked off by the healing of two different blind men, one at the middle of Mark 8 and the other at the end of Mark 10. These miracle bookends illustrate dramatically how discipleship includes spiritual insight regarding who Jesus is and where he is going. As his teachings challenge the twelve disciples about 2,000 years ago, so they continue to confront disciples today with the deep cost and benefit of following Jesus. Sunday, August 11, Seeing Clearly Read Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. Why did it take Jesus two touches to heal the blind man? And what lessons came out of this account? Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. 
Once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home, saying, Don't go even into the village. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. The Gospels report a number of blind people healed by Jesus. Besides the passage here in Mark chapter 8, blind Bartimaeus is healed as reported in Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52, which we'll read right now. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Matthew refers to two blind men in Matthew twenty, twenty-nine to 34 As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the more, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? he asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. And John chapter 9 tells the story of Jesus healing a man born blind who washes in the pool of Siloam. And let's have a look at that. This is a very interesting one, beginning at verse 1 of chapter 9 of John. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home, seeing... His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begged, asking, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now, the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. 
Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of the age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. This was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are his fellow disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. But this story in Mark chapter 8 is unique. It appears only in Mark, and it is the only miracle of Jesus that requires Two actions to bring perfect health. As part of the story, it is a touching detail that Jesus takes the man by the hand and leads him out of the village. One can sense his sympathy for the man's disability. But why two touches? As this is the only miracle in which two actions are involved, it is not likely because of any lack of power on Jesus' part. Instead, it is more likely an acted parable, illustrating how spiritual insight sometimes takes time to unfold. That is what is happening for Jesus' disciples. The entire section, Mark chapter 8, verse 22, right through to chapter 10, verse 52, begins and ends with the healing of a blind man. In this section of Mark, Jesus is especially teaching his disciples about his coming death. They have trouble grasping it, even though he tells them numerous times. Just like the blind man, they need two touches to see clearly. 
Restoring of sight becomes a metaphor for insightful discipleship. Teachers love questions. They are often the key to unlocking a student's understanding. In this passage in Mark 8, the turning point of the book has arrived. Three characteristics confirm this assertion. First, Jesus questions his disciples about his identity, something he has not done before this point. Second, Peter is the first person not demon-possessed who declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Third, immediately following this revelation of who Jesus is, he begins to explain where he is going, to the cross. Why does Jesus tell his disciples to tell no one that he is the Messiah? It seems counterintuitive to establishing the kingdom of God. However, in Jesus' day, Messiah had political overtones of overthrowing Roman rule. Jesus did not come to be that kind of Messiah. Hence, his call for silence on his identity. So to finish the day, What does this story teach us about times when it's important not to say some things, however true they might be? Monday, August 12, The Cost of Discipleship Read Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38. What does Jesus teach here about the cost of following Christ? We begin at verse 31 of chapter 8. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their souls? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes, in his Father's glory, with the holy angels." The disciples have come to a crucial turning point in their relationship with Jesus. They now know that he is the Messiah. The reader of Mark has known this from the beginning of the book, as we read in chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, and thus has had an advantage over the sometimes bumbling disciples. When Jesus first called the disciples, he said he would make them fishers of men in verse 17. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. There was no talk of trouble. But now that they really know who he is, he unfolds to them the goal of his mission, that it is necessary for him to suffer many things, to be rejected and killed, and then to rise again after three days. It is shocking news. Peter, who just confessed that Jesus is the Messiah, takes him aside and rebukes him for saying such things. All of this was told in indirect discourse, but now the Gospel writer reports the words of Jesus, words that must have stung as Peter heard them. He calls Peter Satan and tells him to get out of his way since such thoughts are not in accord with the will of God. Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 415, Peter's words were not such as would be a help and solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. 
they were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace toward a lost world, nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by his own example. End of quote. Followers of Jesus are called to have the same goal he has, to take the cross and to follow him. Crucifixion was the most cruel, humiliating and intimidating method of execution that the Romans had. Everyone wanted to avoid the cross. So why would anyone want to take up the cross as a symbol of their devotion to Jesus? Jesus explains not only the cost of discipleship, but also its great value. In the paradox of Christian faith, losing one's life becomes the way to find it. In contrast, gaining the whole world but forfeiting eternal life is nonsensical. As missionary Jim Elliot put it so eloquently in his journal of October 28, 1949, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And so to finish today, in John 12.25 we read, He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. How have you experienced the reality of these words? Tuesday, August 13, The Mountain and the Multitude Read Mark chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. What did Peter, James and John see one night with Jesus? Chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before you see that the kingdom of God has come with power. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James and John with him and led him up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. In Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus predicts that some standing with him would not taste death before seeing the kingdom of God come in power. That prediction is fulfilled within a few days when he takes Peter, James and John up a high mountain alone. There he is transfigured before them into the glory of the heavenly kingdom. Elijah and Moses appear from the heavenly realm and converse with Jesus. Luke notes that they were talking about Jesus' departure. The Greek word is exodos, that he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. As we read in Luke 9, verses 30 and 31, Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Thus, 
This scene of glory is tied to Jesus' coming death on the cross, as we read in Mark 9, verse 9. Let's read that again. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. It would give hope when the disciples see him crucified. Upon descending the mountain the following morning, the three disciples asked Jesus about Elijah coming first. Likely this idea is tied to the expectation that Elijah would reappear before the Messiah, as we read in Malachi chapter 4 and verses 4 and 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Jesus replies that Elijah has already come, a reference to John the Baptist. Just as they killed John, so Jesus will die at their hands. But he will rise after three days. After the night of glory, the scene at the bottom of the mountain was sad, as we read in Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father explained, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. He replied, This kind can come out only by prayer. The nine disciples had encountered a demon-possessed boy whom they could not heal. When Jesus arrives at the scene, everyone runs to see him. The story unfolds of the demon's power over the child. Jesus seems to take a long time inquiring about the details of the demon possession. It proves too much for the father who blurts out, If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us, in verse 22. Jesus immediately picks up on the expression of doubt. The Lord's response can be paraphrased, What do you mean, if you can, in verse 23? Suddenly, like a bolt of lightning from the sky, the Father sees that it is not only his Son who has a problem, he has a problem of unbelief. And his unbelief could result in his Son not being healed. The desperate father casts himself on Jesus' mercy with the memorable line, I believe, help my unbelief, in verse 24. Jesus heals the boy. And so to finish the day, 
in what situations, if any, have you had to cry out, I believe, help my unbelief? What did you learn from these experiences? Wednesday, August 14. Who is the greatest? Read Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 41. What is different about Jesus' second prediction of his death and resurrection? And compare it with Mark 8.31. Also, what do the disciples argue about and what instruction does Jesus give? First of all, we read Mark 9, beginning at verse 30. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum, When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. And we compare that with Mark 8.31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. In the first prediction, Jesus refers to those who will reject him and kill him. In the second prediction, Jesus refers to the fact that he will be betrayed. The betrayer is not pointed out at this time, but the reader already knows who it is because of the identification of Judas in Mark 3.19 and Judas Iscariot who betrayed him. Again the Lord refers to being killed and then rising after three days. But the disciples seem even less interested in the details of this prediction than in the first. Unwelcome news does not Ghana discussion. In Mark 8.27, Jesus was north of the Sea of Galilee, near Caesarea Philippi. In Mark 9.32, he is passing through Galilee, and in Mark 9.33, he enters Capernaum. Thus, it is not difficult to envision his journey from north to south. However, he enters Capernaum alone as the twelve disciples lag behind. In the house, he inquires about their discussion on the way. No one speaks up, a sure sign of their discomfort at the question, almost like children caught doing something they know is wrong. Their conversation had been about who was the greatest. As little as some people are willing to admit it, this question of who is greatest is something everyone thinks about. But in the kingdom of God... This idea gets turned upside down. Jesus responds to the problem in two steps. First, he utters the clear statement that to be first or greatest, you have to become a servant. Then Jesus illustrates his meaning by an action. Evidently, a child was standing nearby listening. Jesus takes the child and places him in the midst of the group. That would be intimidating for the child. But then Jesus takes the child in his arms, relaxing the scene. He teaches that 
if you receive the child, you receive him, and if you receive him, you receive his father. Thus, the lowest child is linked to God himself. John asks a question about outsiders, and Jesus teaches the important lesson that those not against us are for us. The Lord affirms that helping those in Christian service, even in small ways, does not go unnoticed in heaven. And so to finish the day, what is the biblical idea of greatness in contrast to the world's idea? Which one are you striving for? Thursday, August 15, The Healthy Man in Hell Read Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 50. What ties the teachings of Jesus together in this passage? Well, let's look at Mark 9, beginning at verse 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where... The worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? Have salt among yourselves, and be at peace with each other. At first this passage may seem to be a collection of disparate teachings of Jesus thrown together without any rhyme or reason. However, a closer look reveals that each successive teaching has a catchword connection to the previous one. The passage revolves around three main terms that move the instruction forward step by step. Causes to sin, fire and salt. The first teaching is about little ones referring to new believers. Teachers and leaders are tasked in the kingdom of God with the responsibility to care for these new converts with special care, similar to the Old Testament ethic of caring for those weakest in ancient society, widows, orphans and foreigners. Jesus speaks in hyperbole that it would be better to be drowned in the sea than to cause one of these little ones to sin. The catchphrase, causes to sin, leads to the longest teaching in this passage. Two conundrums confront the reader. First, is Jesus really teaching people to cut off a hand or foot or pluck out an eye? Second, is he teaching an eternally burning hell? The answer to the first question is no. Jesus is not teaching mutilation. That was rejected in Judaism as we compare with Deuteronomy 14 and verse 1. You are the children of the Lord your God. Do not cut yourselves or shave the front of your heads for the dead. And 1 Kings 18 verses 27 to 28. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or travelling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. The Lord is using hyperbole to make his point. If losing a hand, foot or eye is terrible, how much more a disaster should it be for the Christian to sin. The second question also receives a negative answer. No, Jesus is not teaching an eternally burning hell. How do we know? First, the passage contains a certain comedic aspect. 
Consider people entering the heavenly city with one eye or one foot or one hand. Then consider people who are whole going to hell. Should it not be the other way round? The healthy man in hell? That is comedy. Such comedy over a serious topic leads one to consider that Jesus is illustrating a point with hyperbole. Sin should be taken so seriously that it would be better to lose a hand, foot or eye than to sin. As to hell being eternal, its consequences are eternal, not the fire of hell itself. We read in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish. Those who are lost do not burn forever. Instead, they perish forever. A very big difference. Friday, August 16, Further Thought From The Desire of Ages, page 436, we read, Before honour is humility. To fill a high place before men, heaven chooses the worker who, like John the Baptist, takes a lowly place before God. The most childlike disciple is the most efficient in labour for God. The heavenly intelligences can cooperate with him who is seeking not to exalt self, but to save souls. End of quote. And then from page 440. But all that has given us advantage over another, be it education and refinement, nobility of character, Christian training, religious experience, we are in debt to those less favoured. And so far as lies in our power, we are to minister unto them. If we are strong, we are to stay up the hands of the weak. Angels of glory that do always behold the face of the Father in heaven, joy in ministering to his little ones. Trembling souls who have many objectionable traits of character are their special charge. Angels are ever-present where they are most needed, with those who have the hardest battle with self to fight and whose surroundings are the most discouraging. And, in this ministry, Christ's true followers. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. Read again Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 29. How often do you confess to others your belief in Jesus as the Christ? Mark 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Question 2. What is the right balance between the mountaintop experience of communion with Christ and the down-on-the-plane experience of service to others' needs? 3. In class, discuss the answer to the question about greatness at the end of Wednesday's study. What did you determine is the difference between how the world views greatness and how God does? Who were some of the people the world deems great that perhaps God doesn't? In contrast, whom might God deem great that the world ignores or even disdains? What does this difference tell us about how warped and twisted the world's ideals really are? And question four. How can we learn to take sin so seriously that, as Jesus said, you're better off to be maimed than to sin? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Food Choices Trigger an Uproar by Andrew McChesney One Sabbath, Anush and Mother returned home from lunch from church to learn that father had made plans for a countryside picnic. 
Let's barbecue, he said. Anush remembered how the Israelites had prepared their Sabbath meals on Friday before the Sabbath hours in Exodus 16 and wondered whether it was a good idea to barbecue on Sabbath. Out loud she said, No, Father, that's not a good plan. I don't even eat meat. She had become a vegetarian. Father called off the picnic, but he still didn't grasp that Anush no longer ate meat. The next day he prepared chicken for Sunday lunch and handed her a piece. Father, I don't eat meat, Anush said. Now Father understood and he was upset. He thought it was abnormal not to eat meat. The next day he forbade Anush and Mother from going to prayer meeting at the house church in their town. When the pair protested, Father angrily aired frustrations that he had collected against Adventists. He criticised the biblical requirement to return tithe and offerings, as read in Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 to 10. Tithe and offerings are a business, he said. You are just supporting a business. He accused the Adventist church of being a foreign group intent on destroying Armenia. He lashed out at Anusha's lifestyle. Today you say, I don't eat meat, and tomorrow you will say, I don't have a father, he said. Anush sat still and prayed silently. What should I say, Lord? Every time Father spoke against God or the church, she prayed. This is not addressed to me. This is addressed to you. It's your responsibility to answer. She remembered in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, which says, The goodness of God leads to repentance, as stated in the New King James Version. She sensed God was saying to extend a similar, similar goodness to her father. She prayed, There's nothing that I can do except love father. Father owned a small grocery store. When he left mother or Anush in charge, they wouldn't sell alcohol or cigarettes. Now, as father berated them, he felt condemned. Do you think that I'm evil and you're good because I sell alcohol and cigarettes and you don't? He asked. I'm a better Christian than you. I'm going to lead Sabbath worship services from now on. You can no longer go to church. I will lead the worship services. That ended the conversation. Anush went to her room and mother followed and both were shocked. What will we do? Mother asked. Anush suggested cooperating with father as long as he didn't oppose the Bible. He said we will worship at home on Sabbath, she said. He didn't take away our Bibles and he even respects the Sabbath. Let's wait for the Sabbath. If he keeps his word, we will keep the Sabbath at home with him. If he forgets his word, we will pray and see how God guides us.